So last week I uploaded a televised debate that I had with Martin Kennedy, who is the president of the National Farmers Union in Scotland. Now, throughout the debate, Martin was making some truly outlandish and just ridiculous comments. In fact, he just straight up lied on television. Now, thankfully, I was able to respond to many of the things that he said, although not in as much detail as I would have liked to, but there were also many claims that he made that I wasn't able to respond to. So I thought that in today's video, I would go through the debate and really highlight just how absurd Martin's arguments really are. If we were to treat um, animals in the way that we're actually treating human beings in society just now, and I'm not just talking about the, the situation we have in Ukraine, but we treat human beings in a serious manner just now, we would be locked up if we treated um, uh, animals in the way we're actually treating people in society right now. You know, we need people to have food, we need people to have water and shelter. That's not happening in many parts of society just now. I mean, this is just an absolutely insane argument. How could any rational or sane person think for a second that the way that we treat animals is better than the way that we treat humans. And more disturbingly still, this is now the second time that I have heard this argument used during a televised debate. The first time being when I was recently on GB News. In actual fact, I think that a lot of animals get a better death than uh, human beings do, but that's a different uh, question. Maybe well, human beings don't have their throats, but obviously. Now, Martin's argument seems to rest on the fact that because animals are fed, that means that we treat them well because not all humans have access to food. But how does feeding animals constitute genuine care and interest in an animal's actual well-being? When, of course, the reason these animals are fed is because it's the only way to make sure they reach slaughter weight. So, of course, farmers feed their animals, but not because they actually care about them, but because they want to make money off them and the only way they can do that is fatten them up to slaughter weight using food. In the UK we kill about 90% of pigs and the majority of chickens in gas chambers. So I guess rather than palliative care we should load the terminally ill into gas chambers and gas them to death using an aversive concoction of carbon dioxide or at the very least we should just cut their throats. But I suppose why wait for them to be terminally ill? If we really cared about humans we'd be slaughtering them at a fraction of their lifespan after we've already mutilated and sexually exploited them because it's about time we started treating humans like we do animals. So anyway, I pointed out the absurdity of what Martin was saying by highlighting things like the gassing of pigs or the fact that we kill animals by cutting their throats at a fraction of their lifespan. And this is what he had to say in response. M Martin, do you want to respond to that? Because what, what Ed's describing is, hor is horrific. <laughs> Yeah, it's absolutely horrific. That's not, that is, this is not this is not the case at all. I and mean, when you look at the the welfare that's done through abattoirs that's carried out now, we're not the same as what happens maybe in some other parts of the world. That is not happening here. Let me just lay this out for you. The president of the National Farmers Union in Scotland, which is the highest ranking position, has just stated on TV that the things that we do to animals are horrific. But not to worry, because the things I just described don't happen to animals in the UK. Now this is utterly mind-blowing because it means one of two things. Either Martin doesn't know what happens to animals in the UK, or he's just outright lying. Although I guess it's hardly surprising that the animal farming industries do lie. I mean, imagine what would happen if they told the truth. Imagine if they said something like, yes, we do force pigs into gas chambers where we use a concentration of CO2 above 80%, even though scientific studies have shown that concentrations above 20% cause an aversive reaction for pigs. And yes, nearly 20 years ago, the UK government's own Farm Animal Welfare Advisory Committee did say that we should phase out gas chambers because of welfare issues, but at the end of the day, the reason we use them more now than ever is because they're the most cost efficient way of killing pigs and allow us to kill more of them in a shorter amount of time. Now, I wonder why animal farmers never say that. And isn't it strange how I merely just stated objectively what it is that we do to animals? I didn't apply overly emotive language to what I was saying. I just merely objectively stated that they use adversive concoctions of CO2 to gas pigs and that animals are killed by having their throats cut. I didn't say how this CO2 causes the moisture in the pig's eyes and in their throats to acidify, causing them pain. I didn't describe how animals are forced into stun boxes and desperately try to escape as they panic at the sight of the slaughterhouse worker trying to position the captive bolt above their head. I did didn't apply any emotive language to describe the objectively grisly reality of what animals are forced to endure. I basically described it in the most bare bones and objective manner possible, and this was still called 
horrific. However, instead of trying to defend what his industry does to animals every single day, Martin instead lies by saying that doesn't happen in the UK before trying to divert the conversation into a different direction by saying that we rely on animal products for things like zinc and iron and B12. Um, and we rely on that readily source of protein, zinc, iron, vitamin B12 that is readily available through red meat. And we, 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 we need that, meat, that source of red meat to be there for the benefit of our health. Which is not true. Those nutrients are essential, but it's not essential that we get them from animals. So we don't rely on animals to get those nutrients in the same way that just because B12 can be found in dog feces doesn't mean that we rely on dog feces to get B12. Now Martin then goes on to talk about the environment, which I'll address in just a moment, but before I do, I wanted to address how Martin responds to me, pointing out the fact that he's just lied. What I was arguing was that you were saying this is a brutal way of, of slaughter. That is not the case. Every, every possible thing is done for the benefit of the animal's welfare in, in a slaughterhouse and we've got some of the best slaughterhouses in the world. So firstly, Martin agrees with the presenter that the things that I described happening to animals are horrific, but he says, no, 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 don't worry because those things don't actually happen in the UK. And then when I point out to him that he's just lied, he says, no, 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 that's not what I was saying. What I was actually saying is those things aren't brutal and they're all done in the best interests of the animals. So just think about that for a second. We kill animals at a fraction of their lifespan by forcing them into gas chambers or by cutting their throats. Not to mention that the vast majority of them endure processes like selective breeding, mutilations, forced impregnation, separations of babies from their mothers. And then, after everything we do to these animals, we have the audacity to claim that everything we do is for the benefit of these animals. Now this is such an obvious statement that it's demoralizing to say the least that I have to actually state this very obvious fact. But if we actually cared about the best interests of animals and wanted to do things for the benefit of these animals, then the last thing that we would do to them is exploit them and kill them. But one of the most sickening statements that Martin makes in all of this is when he says that we have the best slaughterhouses in the world, as if that's something to be proud of. I mean, imagine trying to show off by saying that we're the best in the world and needlessly slitting the throats of sentient beings. Wow, doesn't that just make you so proud? With what are you talking about? You do to look so shit He asked you, Kenny. Okay, so now let's take a look at some of the environmental arguments that Martin also makes. Biogenic methane that's, that's emitted by not just animals, um, but it's also emitted by decaying uh, plants as well. That biogenic methane is actually recycled back into the ground where it originally came from. So methane, although albeit okay. is more damaging when it's in the atmosphere, it's only there for, for about 12 to 15 years. And that carbon, that methane breaks down to carbon and water and sequestered by Okay. into the soil where it originally came from. Firstly, this is just totally bogus. Just because methane has a relatively short half-life in comparison to carbon dioxide doesn't mean that it's not severely damaging for the environment. The problem is these animals are creating methane which wouldn't have existed if these animals weren't being farmed in the first place. So it's irrelevant if methane has a short half-life. What's relevant is this methane is being created when it doesn't need to be, and this methane is contributing to global warming. Plus the methane that is breaking down is continuously being replaced, which means that atmospheric methane levels are always remaining consistently high. Now ironically for Martin, the fact that methane has a short half-life is a good argument for veganism, because by removing animals from our food system, we would feel the benefit of doing so within a couple of decades, which means that as atmospheric methane levels decrease as a consequence of removing one of the biggest emitters of methane globally, we are buying time to also remove carbon from our atmosphere as well. This is why for the past 18 months or so, there has been such a huge discussion in the environmental community about addressing methane immediately. And even last year, the executive director of the United Nations Environment Programme stated this. Cutting methane is the strongest lever we have to slow climate change over the next 25 years and complements necessary efforts 
to reduce carbon dioxide. Yeah, I, I think that's an, an, an incredible statement. You do, you do realise that we're actually only 60% self-sufficient in food here in the UK. Food security is right at the top of so many people's agenda right now. There's a lot of the vegan diets rely on a lot of imports and imported products that we cannot produce here. And that has implications worldwide on other nations and other countries that can't actually afford that because they would demand on some of the products that come from other parts of the world. Yes, that's right. We're not fully self-sufficient in the UK. Now I wonder why that might be. Fortunately for us, we don't have to wonder anymore because this exact thing has actually been studied. Unsurprisingly, it's to do with the fact that 85% of the UK's agricultural footprint is specifically for animal farming, which means about 48% of the entire landmass of the UK is just for animal farming, and one third of the landmass of the UK is permanent pastureland. That's what all that managed land behind Martin is, that land he's so proud of. The backdrop that's behind me is not like that for no reason. That's been a managed landscape with livestock for, you know, hundreds of years. Well, basically, it's deforested land. So we cut down all the trees and destroyed all the habitats on that land so instead we could create pasturelands that we could graze animals on. It's a funny thing trying to use self-sufficiency as an argument for animal farming when animal farming is the reason that we're not self-sufficient in the UK. Case in point, a study by Harvard Law School pointed out how just one third of the cropland in the UK that's used to grow feed for animals, just one third of that could be used to produce enough fruits and vegetables for almost every single person in the UK to get their five servings of fruits and vegetables every single day. And guess what? According to that same study, if we turned the cropland that is used to grow feed for animals into land that's used to grow food for humans, well then we would be self-sufficient. It's animal farming that stops us from being self-sufficient. If we use that land to grow food for humans, well then we would be self-sufficient. And on top of that, that also means that that 84,000 square kilometers of pasture land that's used for grazing, which is one third of the entire landmass of the UK, would also be freed up and could be rewilded, which is precisely the point I was trying to make in the debate. Basically, we can rewild all of that land and just use the cropland that's currently used to feed animals to grow food for humans and be self-sufficient at the same time. And on the point of Martin saying that vegans import food, well, it's not just vegans who import food. Something that animal farmers always conveniently like to overlook is how much feed is imported into the UK to feed the animals farmed in the UK. In fact, 70% of the animal agriculture industry's soy, rapeseed, and maize requirements are imported into the UK. Martin also talks about using methane inhibitors such as seaweed. We're doing it in a sustainable manner and, and with new technologies now, we're using natural products such as looking at seaweed and methane inhibitors. Which is a little bit of a red herring considering that there is no supply chain in place which provides seaweed to animal farmers. Basically, it's something that's been studied very little and has shown promising results, but it's not something that's been rolled out. And it's not something that Martin or animal farmers in the UK are using. So he's talking about something that doesn't even exist yet. And also, do methane inhibitors actually change anything? I mean, firstly, methane isn't the only environmental problem associated with animal farming. But beside that point, the environmental concerns of animal farming aren't the reason why animal farming should be brought to an end. Even if you made animal farming completely sustainable and animals didn't produce any methane, that wouldn't make it any more moral or any less objectionable. The problem with animal farming isn't the environmental concerns, that's a problem. But the problem with animal farming is the exploitation of sentient beings, the subjugation of animals, their needless exploitation, the needless suffering inflicted upon them, and the needless deaths that they are forced to endure as a consequence of our needless consumption of their flesh and secretions. And one of the last points that he makes is about how rewilding would be bad, because if there were wildfires, they would produce emissions. As it's rewilded, and as I said earlier on, methane then comes from decaying okay. um, uh, uh, vegetation okay. as well, just, and just... then we get a tinder dry, tinder dry environment that if it goes down to a wildfire, that's the biggest emissions you can have. What Martin is saying is that we shouldn't have forests and woodlands, because by having forests and woodlands, we could have wildfires, which could then emit emissions. And so when you actually think about what Martin's saying, the implications are terrifying. He's saying that we shouldn't have these important landscapes because there could be something bad that happens which produces emissions. 
But even if that was to occur, the emissions being produced by the wildfires would just be emitting the carbon that had been sequestered by the trees and vegetation in the first place. So if we weren't to rewild these landscapes, it just means that that carbon is stored in the atmosphere as it currently is instead. And Martin thinks that that would be better, and not only that that would be better, but in the place of where all these trees and forests and woodlands could be, we should have grazing animals who are also emitting emissions that have been stored in our atmosphere. Plus, it's Scotland. Whilst there are wildfires, the environment of Scotland is very different to the environment of Southern California. So the issue of wildfires is never going to be severe enough to even make the argument that Martin is making remotely sensible or remotely rational. This is meat industry propaganda at its most terrifying and at its most bewildering. And the final point that I think is important to address is Martin recommends that people check out the work of Professor Alice Stanton. So Alice Stanton is a professor at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, and she's also a director of Devonish Nutrition, which is an agri-technology company that produces animal feed. Her main point is that unprocessed meat isn't as bad as we've been told that it is. And actually, red meat contains essential nutrients that are vital for human health, which is true. It's just that those essential nutrients can also be found elsewhere. And not only that, but Alice Stanton herself has even said this. I'm not against vegetarianism or veganism. It is possible to have a balanced diet with vegetarianism. It's a little bit more challenging, but still possible with veganism. However, it requires a lot of knowledge and effort, which doesn't happen in the majority of the population. People don't have time to invest in getting a really balanced diet through a range of plant-based foods. And look, what she's saying isn't even true. It takes minutes to Google how to get plant-based sources of iron, zinc, and B12. But even if what she was saying was true, the answer wouldn't be to continue needlessly exploiting and killing animals and contributing to the environmental damage that comes as a consequence of that. The answer would be to make plant-based foods more accessible and to provide more information to people about how to be plant-based healthfully and to educate people about where nutrients actually come from. That's the solution. But to be honest, if the person that Martin is pointing us to is a director of an animal feed company and still even states themselves that you can be healthy on a plant-based diet, I'm not really sure how this helps Martin's cause. And look, whilst what Professor Alice Stanton says isn't true, even if it was the case that the consumption of unprocessed red meat didn't cause heart disease or certain forms of cancer, that wouldn't make it acceptable to eat. After all, the reason why kicking a dog is bad is not because it might hurt your foot. The reason it's bad is because it hurts the dog. In the same way, the reason why consuming unprocessed red meats is bad is not because it might cause cancer or heart disease, it's because it harms the animals who have been exploited and slaughtered for those products. And that's always the bottom line. All right, well, that brings us to the end of this video and the end of my response to Martin. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed it and I hope it's fully addressed all of the claims that Martin made throughout this televised segment because he made so many claims that I just could not believe I was listening to. As always, let me know down below in the comments what you thought of this video and what you thought of my responses to Martin. And also let me know down below what you thought of the debate itself. All right, thank you so much for watching everyone. I really do appreciate it. And I will see you all in the next video.